Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 55. Do you think it's time to refactor your Python code? What should you think about before starting this task? This week on the show, we have Brendan McGinnis and Nick Thapen from Sorcery. Sorcery is an automated refactoring tool that integrates into your IDE and suggests improvements to your code. Nick and Brendan provide advice on how to start refactoring and setting achievable code objectives. We discuss setting up unit testing and building confidence that you aren't changing your code's fundamental meaning. We also talk about technical debt and how it can creep into your organization's projects. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean's app platform. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Nick and Brendan. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having us. Hello there. Today, we're here talking about refactoring, and I kind of wanted to go just a little bit into a little background on really what is that. And so maybe I can just ask somebody specifically here. So Nick, do you mind starting off and just kind of giving like a bird's eye view of like what, what you see as uh, refactoring? Yeah. So I guess it's the process of kind of improving the quality of code without changing what it does. Okay. So often when you're writing code, you might hack together a solution and it works. It does what you want it to do. The kind of is not for the next person coming in, it's not very readable or maintainable. So you might sort of clean it up and improve the structure before you actually commit it. So this is kind of process of improving code, I'd say. Okay. Yeah. Brandon, do you have stuff to add to that? Yeah. So there's also other times that refactoring can be done. So it's not just when you're writing code for the first time. If, if uh, you're coming to add new features to code, then maybe you need to change it at that point and often a good time to do refactoring is at that point okay make the code easier to work with so you can add those features more easily as well yeah i wondered about that i did like a little dive into to kind of read up you know about like sort of what people have written about it and they had like kind of three sort of factors that that i thought of which would be uh, ones that that you were mentioning, Nick, of the the readability of the code and making sure that it's understandable and making it presentable in a way that others hopefully can join in on the project and and you know make heads or tails of what's happening yeah. and sort of potentially reducing maybe complexity might be part of that too, which kind of starts to lean into what you're saying, Brendan. But then also, I think what you're saying, Brendan, is this other one, which is sort of the idea: if this project needs to grow. And this is a term that I spent some time talking with Dane Hillard about this idea of extensibility, the idea that, okay, this code needs to be able to work with other code. <laughs> and so maybe that's that might be part of the, yeah. the issue you're running into. Did I get that right? Yeah, absolutely. So first time you write code, it may you may have some very simple requirements and you don't need a huge amount of structure and design to it. You can write a relatively simple solution. But as more functionality is required, more structure is often required to make everything clear and readable and understandable and, like you say, extendable. And so this is often the time to, when you understand how the code needs, needs to change, and that's when you do the refactoring. Okay. You make it clearer and easier and more extendable. And it's kind of the best way of writing code as well. So if you start with a skeleton that works, and then you iterate on it and increase, add new features. So you don't write whole screeds of things you're never going to need, and you kind of understand what you're doing as, you, as you're doing it. Okay. In that process, are there, outside of you know these software tools that we're going to talk about a little bit more that can help with the process, what would be techniques or maybe, a, I don't even want to call them tools, but like, you know, sort of uh, methodologies that people look at for, for doing this? Yeah, I guess um, 
unit testing is a very important part of the puzzle because often you don't want to be refactoring code if you're worried you're going to break it. That's kind of the worst thing. And when I do a manual refactor, often I will break the tests. Okay. You know, then the tests will pop up red, I fix them, they're green again, and then you can refactor again. It's kind of this cycle you go through. I think people call it red, green refactor sometimes. Of like, first make sure it's tested, and then you have the confidence to be able to change the code structure. Because if it's not tested and you haven't got that confidence, then it's kind of, it's like this first company we worked in had a massive code base and you were very, no unit tests. You were very nervous. You went in and made the littlest change possible. Yeah. And you'd never have undergone big refactoring there. Is that, I worked for a bank for a while. And in that circumstance, we had large amounts of data. Uh, it was mortgages. And so not only did, I really think of the data was like kind of the most important sort of part of the formula in the sense that they had this entire staging environment, mm. uh, not only like a playground development environment, but then, you know, obviously the production kind of environment. Is is that similar in the sense of like, if you're working on something where you have code set up, where you would be kind of refactoring inside of that sort of staging area? Yeah, I think it's a confidence thing, really. Okay. You, when refactoring, you you need to be confident that you're not changing the meaning of the code. That's the key thing. And one excellent way for that is having these tests that tell you, okay, this is what the code did before. Once I change the structure of it, it still needs to pass all those tests. So we know it's doing exactly the same as it was before. And if you if you've got that safety net, you can be confident to do completely wild refactorings. Whatever you like to do, you can try things out. And you know, at the end of the day, if all the tests are still passing, the functionality is the same. So however you want to structure it, if you think that's how the code is going to be best going forward, you can go and make those changes. If you don't have that safety net, you have to be very, very cautious about what you do. And you're unlikely to be able to find the best final outcome for the code. You can only take those, I mean, you might be able to make some improvements to the code, but anything that's a bit bigger than that, you just don't have the confidence to go ahead and try it out. Yeah, because we've chatted to some people who are working on this code base without tests, and they will only do refactoring sort of the, you can do through the ID or through a tool. So they need to have that confidence they haven't made a manual typing error. Yeah. If there's no unit tests. Okay, so if you were, uh, let's say, consulting a company and and they're looking at, doing this kind of project of refactoring and you pretty quickly notice that they haven't added tests. Like what, how deep does that go? Like how many tests are needed? Like, is there like some sort of metric that you would use to say, okay, we have uh, the proper amount of tests in place before we can start moving into red light, green light (laughs) kind of mode. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think, you can probably go bottom up, like just pick a place, start writing tests for it. Okay. Once you've got hundred percent code coverage on, you know, your function or your your class, you can start doing some refactoring. Um, you don't need to kind of go through the whole system writing all the tests, which would be a very kind of maybe a very long project uh, before you can start. Yeah. Also the important bit is which part of the code base is gonna change. Mm. There's no point refactoring a part of the code base that works perfectly and has no change in future requirements. It's where are we going to be adding the new functionality? And then the important bit is actually to test that functionality. It's not actually necessary to test every line of code as long as we're testing what we expect the outcome of the programs to be. Okay. So as long as we've got that completely locked down and tested, then we can do that restructuring as we need to. And the best place to do it is obviously the place where we're next going to be making changes to the system or where there's going to be a lot of changes upcoming because we get most return on our investment. So writing those tests takes time, so we need to get the value for them. Right. Do you see that people sometimes get into sort of a spring cleaning mode or whatever you want to call it, and they say, okay, we're going to refactor everything and then sort of end up spinning their wheels in areas that are not like things that you're ready for implementing change or that you were planning for. 
Is that something you've seen happen? Not too often, I'd say. I mean, um, because people are often, they need like a reason. Well, are the refactoring part of your normal workflow? As in, every time you make a change, you tidy up a bit after yourself. Okay. I think that's kind of the ideal. Or if it's like a case of you're going in and you're like, okay, we've got some technical debt, we need to fix it. Often it's sort of like, okay, as Brendan said, I'll find these these modules that we keep working on that are really difficult and we'll refactor those and concentrate there. Okay. What were you going to say, Brendan? Yeah, I was going to say that the first first aspect that Nick was talking about of always refactoring the code, it's like this Boy Scout rule of leave the code better than when you first found it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. If you, if you can <laughs> build that up as a team, then the code's always improving, the quality gets better, it's always nicely tested, it's always the whole code base is really easy to work with. So that's the ultimate sort of ideal. Working in an environment where everyone is always improving the quality of the code, the code is a joy, it's easy to work with. But obviously, there's many places where (laughs) that's not the case or technical debt has built up despite those aspects and refactoring is still required at certain times. So I've heard that term a lot. And I mean, you guys both have used it a couple times already now. So this idea of technical debt, is there a fairly easy explanation? Or I guess maybe we could think of an example of common technical debt that that you see in organizations' code? Yes, you you can kind of think of it in terms of time. And it's often sort of, I'm going to save time writing this new bit of feature, new feature. I'm not going to do do it nicely. It's going to be this ugly bit of code. So you've you've saved some time but it's going to cost extra time every time you come in and want to fix a bug in that code or or maintain it so it's like you've saved a bit of time but then you're paying the interest on that every time you need to change it and so paying off the technical debt is be how much time will it take for me to clean up that code and make it lovely and beautiful again okay it's kind of one way of thinking about it yeah the i don't know the the sort of project management constraints triangle you've really stretched the shape of the triangle <laughs> and now you're going to have to hammer it back into place um, to be able to get, <laughs> to get a better uh, payoff or, you know, whatever ratio you want to call it um, so that you, you can work it back in. What are common causes of technical debt that you, you've seen? You mentioned um, just, you know, kind of doing something in a hurry. Are there other? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you said, the first one is deadlines. Like you don't have enough time to, really think it out or write the code and then do refactoring before it's all fully committed. But then there's also um, lack of experience. You may you may not know how to design this in a way that's nice and extendable going forwards. And then the third possibility is the requirements change for a project okay. or for a certain area of the project. And suddenly what seemed like a good design that was extendable in a certain direction is no longer, or it doesn't extend in the new direction that uh, the users need. And so there needs to be a refactoring there to allow it to take that new functionality nice and easily. I think of um, remodeling shows, you know, you're watching uh, (laughs) somebody taking apart a, a house and saying, oh, we just wanted to add on this little room over here. And then they open it up and, you know, the rafters are rotted or whatever. (laughs) And and so now you're, you know, not only spending a lot more money, but you're spending time to to even think about how it could support any of that additional code. (laughs) Certainly I've gone in to make a simple bug fix and like opened up the code and be like, oh my God, (laughs) this is is all rotten. It's going to take, (laughs) take a week. Yeah. Does, um, I, I think of a common one that I've experienced a little bit of is turnover in organizations. Is that a common way of that being sort of uh, increased? Yeah, I think if you allow like one person to be the only person to know about something, yeah, yeah, then um, and that is quite easy to do. And then you know they're the only person who understands it. You have to go back to them to ask people. And when they eventually leave, yeah, it could be a massive problem. Yeah, and documentation is actually good way of decreasing that sort of, I guess it's not necessarily directly technical debt, but communication time that's needed. So if I need to go and speak to 
nick about how part of the code works, then that costs a bit of time. If 10 people need to do that, that costs 10 times as much time. And yeah. if, uh, if documentation had been written up front, then that time invested at the start pays back many times over. And probably if I write documentation at some point, I will read it myself in future and be like, oh yeah, that's actually how that bit of code works or why I designed it like that. Yeah, itself, and that person is yourself that you think, like you think you understand the code perfectly and you come back in a few weeks and like, like who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know, get blame or what have you um, <laughs> kind of thing where you start to recognize, oh yeah, okay, that, that was me from... <laughs> it was yeah. definitely me. <laughs> it kind of made me think about another thing kind of related to that, the, the idea of the mythical man month or whatever, that you can't really throw that many bodies at something in the sense that if these are people that are new to this thing and truly the problem is the code is somewhat undocumented and indecipherable, every single one of those people is going to have to get up to speed on it and understanding it. Whereas it may make more sense to, to spend the time of, you know, like one person really fixing the documentation of like, and understanding that code. Um, before really introducing anybody else because it, it it seems so wasteful for everybody to have to learn it again and again and you know <laughs> be throwing their hands up mm, for sure i think when someone on boards on a team it's actually a really good time to work on documentation um because they're looking at the code for the very first time i mean this is if the documentation is not already written yeah then it's a good time to catch up because they will have a lot of questions that may seem obvious to people who've been there for a year or more but at that point in time it's like i don't understand how this bit works and <laughs> yeah the next five people that come on to the team are going to ask exactly the same questions so documenting at that time is a really good opportunity it's kind of funny i thought of two things with that one is the idea you know i've been in organizations that let's just say nobody ever asked questions <laughs> <laughs> and it was really very scary to me. And I was never, I'm fairly new to the development world in general. And, and I was you know brought up in kind of a different era of, of people that were, you know, doing this sort of thing. Like I, I did computer engineering, you know, a long time ago, <laughs> the late eighties, and then kind of have come back and, and gotten more and more into it with a big break and within a whole other, you know, sets of industries in between. And so like, I'm super anxious and ready to ask questions and I, I feel kind of emboldened to do that. And, you know, I don't care if it makes me look dumb or whatever. I just want, I, I need to know. And I feel like it's important, but I was in a culture and this may be just this particular you know set of organizations where they, I think they were brought up not to ask questions. Um, and it was really kind of strange to me and they would just go back and sort of just, you know, they might go on the side and ask somebody <laughs> the question, <laughs> did you understand this or whatever, you know, and it's like, you know, completely inefficient. And then I, the one on top of that was I was thinking about the way you just mentioned it is sort of like a reverse code review is having that person come on board and in that process, you know, like look at this code and generate a bunch of questions for me about it. If you feel like this isn't making sense and so forth. And then, you know, having hopefully a healthy enough organization that they'd be welcome to that sort of reverse code review. <laughs> yeah. It's a great way to think about it. Yeah. You get so j like, yeah, you get so used to things when you're working on them forever that you just don't realize that you know it's so difficult to understand. You've already put in that time. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean's app platform. DigitalOcean's app platform is a new platform as a service solution to build modern cloud native apps. With that platform, you can build, deploy, and scale apps and static websites quickly and easily. Simply point to your GitHub repository and let app platform do all the heavy lifting related to infrastructure. Get started on DigitalOcean's app platform for free at do.co slash realpython. That's do.co slash realpython. One of the things that we talked about when we had our little initial conversation was we were kind of diving a little bit into 
some of the things that a tool like sorcery can do, which is provide metrics. And I thought that was kind of interesting. And so I don't know if you want to dive into that a little bit and talk about how a, a tool like that can kind of look at your, your code and provide some information that's kind of suited to what we're talking about right now. Yeah. So I think it's important to prefix it with that whole point about choosing to refactor the right parts of the code base based on the requirements. But once, once you've got that, then you, there's various different code quality metrics that can help pinpoint areas of the code base that can be improved. And probably like the most simple one is just how long is this function? How many lines of code is this function? Okay. And you don't really need a tool to see that. <laughs> it's very easy to just scan and see that. Especially with Python. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the indentation lasts how long? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Once a piece of code gets beyond a certain length, it's very difficult to keep all of the meaning of that inside your head at one time. And therefore, it's very difficult to know the exact functionality of that piece of code. And so that's the starting point for saying, okay, actually, this needs breaking apart. What are the various things that this function does? Can I split it into smaller pieces of functionality that I can pose together? Okay, yes, I can split it into these three functions. And then the first function just calls those three functions in a row and passes in the outputs of one into the next one. And suddenly, even though we haven't changed the meaning of the code, it's a lot clearer what it does. It does these three things. Okay, that's easy. Now I need to change this piece of functionality. Okay. It's one of the, it's the first thing that needs to change. Okay. I go into this sub function and then change the functionality there. Yeah. Really metrics are, are not something to be measured and optimized really. They're more a guide for areas that can be improved. That's the way I would think of them. So what we do with sorcery is if you kind of hover over function definition. It gives you like just a little really quick quality check of like how long is it? It's got this thing called cognitive complexity, which is basically measuring the nesting. Okay. And that's sort of small nesting is obviously well, fairly obviously harder to understand if it's sort of five nestings deep. You have to sort of keep all that in your head as you're trying to understand what that code is doing. Yeah. And it's also measuring long chains of sort of if this and that or the other and this and that those sort of long chains of booleans so that's one of the other metrics you measure it's kind of just to give you that as brendan was saying that initial quality check of is this function okay should i be working on it and it's kind of also nice to see as you make the changes to see that score improving yeah so you know you're kind of heading in the right direction if you're not as experienced so an experienced programmer will have these sort of intuitions built into their heads of what is good code what is bad code but it takes quite a long time to build those. So it's kind of, in one way, uh, a shortcut. Yeah, that's nice. I was thinking about, as you're saying that, about, okay, as you get more practiced in this, have you found the amount of code you can hold in your head has increased or is it sort of leveled off? <laughs> or, <laughs> or do you think that you find kind of a sweet spot that as you kind of look at more and more code, I think it probably has, but in a different way to just like I can hold all of this code in my head. It's more, I'm better at grouping sections of the code together in my head and then naming it. So I can read five lines of code and be like, oh, okay, it does that. And then um, it's just like, yeah, there's a technical term that I'm trying to think of. So working memory, it's like a psychological working memory. It's like any human can only have five to seven things in their head at once. It's a basic idea. Yeah. And it, if you if you can like name a bit of code well, as Brennan's saying, um, that can be one of those things that could be, represent a whole chunk of code. Yeah. Do you feel like you get better at naming? I th yeah, I think it's more than just naming, though. It's like patterns that you might see in the code before, like hmm. a coding pattern. Oh, I've seen this coding pattern before. This is designed in this way using like the, the visitor pattern or something like that or um right i think of uh authorization and 
like who, who's allowed to do this and do what um, I had the team from Oso on and they were talking about that and it's a whole set of you know patterns that have kind of been handed down over time and similar to like uh you know designing <laughs> database schemas and um so i'm sure there's all sorts of those types of things that are in code yes yeah, it's, it's exactly that the, the first time you try and understand how authentication and authorization works it's like okay there's all these many steps going on what do they all mean and then at some point you're just like okay this is the oauth flow i get it or it's uh, this different type of login flow and that just takes up one piece of inf- one of the seven pieces of information that you can hold in your head at one time and it's over time you get you learn these things, learn how they fit together. You don't increase your working memory. You're just better able to classify things, <laughs> <laughs> I think. And, and probably also not just classify things, but understand the interaction between different things. When are these things going to work well? When are they not? Maybe it's a bit like cooking a meal. At the start, there's like, there's an unlimited number of vegetables and herbs and spices <laughs> you can use and after a while you're like okay basil and tomato go together great i've got that down yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right no that makes sense i was thinking about that too in what you were talking about nick about just like kind of boolean logic kind of stuff and the complexity that that's in there and we released a course really recently that you know like you look at it and you go you know, Python Booleans, blah, oh, that should be easy, right? It's just true and false, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I kind of gave the instructor a little bit of a prompt to say, well, tell me why somebody would want to watch this. And he came up with these really great ways of like kind of, you know, these questions like, okay, well, if you thought about this, like, could you refactor your code this way or could you rewrite it in this way and, and so forth and kind of left it as these open-ended questions. Like, do you know what the right answer is? Okay, well then maybe you should watch this course, <laughs> you know? And, you know, cause it's like an hour of time devoted to just about Booleans, but there's so much <laughs> yeah. in there truly, you know, like of what you can do with it, the, the way that things, what's the term for it? We're, you know, uh, you're looking at an, an and statement or an or st- statement and it simply goes down a quicker path because it a uh, short circuit evaluation. Yeah. Short circuits are like built into that. And so you can kind of look at optimizing your code and it won't, you know, be repetitive in this way if you write it this way. And, um, and so it was really, I learned a lot, you know, in that kind of sense, reviewing the course and kind of thinking about it. And, you know, you kind of, that's one of these things that you get more and more experience, like you said, with, with the language that you kind of start to, to learn, you know, just like the simple patterns of like individual lines, you know, of code and kind of figuring out you know, where that sort of optimizes it. So one of the metrics you mentioned was this idea of looking at the length of, you know, sections of code. Is, is there something kind of tied to that also, like a metric of like documentation, like that might be part of it, like code commenting and function definitions and things like that? Yeah, that's cool. I think it's kind of hard to measure with a number. You kind of know it's done well when you see it. Okay. Because you can certainly have too many code comments. And sure. <laughs> right. This is a stop sign. If it's describing what the code does <laughs> rather than why it's doing it, it's kind of pointless. It's often better to have a well-named variable or something than a comment explaining what it is. So I kind of lean in more in the direction of fewer comments is better. Certainly, you can have kind of enforce having doc strings or whatever. It's hard to enforce having good doc strings. You know? <laughs> I mean, I guess one related thing that isn't documentation is kind of typing information. Okay. Uh, that we're kind of big fans of it and have it in our code and use MyPy. And that's one way of kind of enforcing certain things about the code. Yeah. With some extra information uh, without using comments or documentation. I think that can catch quite a lot of bugs, especially on the interfaces between different bits of code. Yeah. uh, Do you feel that the typing is something that's almost required a a bit for extensibility? I don't think it's required, but I think it is just really useful. Okay. No, it was useful a few years ago. And then as we've used it more and more, it's sort of, yeah, become more impressive (laughs) to me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's often I write some code and I run the typing. I'm like, oh, yeah, I didn't actually think about that edge case. I should tighten up a bit. The other thing about typing is it is a form of documentation. Right. 
So if you go and read a function definition and you see that it takes A and B, it's like, I'm not quite sure what this does, but if you see it takes A and B and they're an int and a string, yeah. you might have a bit better idea of what it does and you know exactly what you're allowed to pass in to that function as well. Right. If you see something as month, it could be interpreted multiple ways. <laughs> you know, does somebody actually want an actual string typed in there or or what have you um, versus, a, a you know, an integer or a value or whatever? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you feel like, you know, I, I, you know I, I jokingly was saying, do you feel like you got better at, at naming things? Do you think that there are specific techniques that you would follow when naming things in the process of refactoring that, that help with this process? I mean, I think you do get better at naming things over time just because you get <laughs> more experience and you've seen the names used before for these kinds of things, and so you can reuse them. And that's particularly true within a project. So if you encounter a project for the first time and someone says, right, go and write this code at this side of the, this part of the project, you'll use naming conventions and the types of names that you've used in your previous projects. But maybe there's specific names, a shared language for that project that's used across the rest of the code base. And so it's also learning what's relevant for the project and the organization and the code base, which is part of it. Yeah. I, I noticed when I was looking at Swift and Objective-C originally that they would have extremely long names. <laughs> like they were very ver verbose in sort of the camel case style. You know, it was almost like a, a sentence and more than a phrase sometimes of like what this thing did. And I was like, okay, it seems like a little bit much, but I, I can I can understand that there won't be any confusion <laughs> as to what this thing is, you know, as opposed to being maybe clever about it. And and so I, I wonder, like, you know, I I I know a little bit of Pep Eight and you know some of the other you know ideas inside of Python conventions, but I, I kind of see people sometimes being a little too clever, <laughs> you know, with, with certain things or trying to uh, you know maybe come up with a way to rewrite it later, but it, I feel like longer isn't really a problem with most IDEs, you know, in the sense that it helps you with completion a lot. Yeah, the challenge is when naming something is to get out of your own head. Yeah. And think about what the next person who's reading it will think. Will they understand what this does? Will they understand how to use it? If you can if you can do that in a in a couple of words or one word then great if it needs to be a bit longer then that's probably the best thing to do even if it's <laughs> even if it's several words long yeah totally and it kind of comes back to what we we're saying only about holding bits in your head sort of you know the code should tell a nice story of what it does so if you're sort of reading the functions of a or the sub functions you'd be like it does this and this and this and you kind of read read it like prose um that's kind of the ideal yeah well i think of python being very readable already which is kind of nice though you know there's the complaint people have about typing is sometimes it could kind of break up the reading a little bit and i understand that i mean it was definitely one of those things when when i i got introduced to it by looking at other packages and things like that where i was like what is this funny bit of stuff <laughs> they've added here um that doesn't seem to do anything <laughs> you know it doesn't seem functional from my you know just eyeballing it so it's kind of an interesting layer of you know, complexity that, I mean, once you're introduced to it and you kind of understand what typing is, it, it becomes like, okay, part of the scenery and, and definitely adds to the documentation, like you said. Yeah, I think that applies pretty much to any new technique that you encounter. There's always this challenge of like, oh, what is this? Is it worth it? Like first time you see a with statement, oh, what's the point of this with statement? Yeah. And then eventually you're like, okay, it's going to, close my file no matter what exceptions happen okay that's brilliant i don't need to think about it anymore it's safe yeah those are cool yeah like i i didn't know what those did at all initially and the idea that there's sort of this whole entry into it and then sort of exiting it out of it and this idea that those that it kind of ties all that together 
uh, is is kind of powerful in a way, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. Yeah. We mentioned a couple of the metrics that something like sorcery can do. We mentioned the idea that it would look at the overall complexity of like functions. What else does it look at for you? Well, the main functionality of sorcery is it's not really code metrics. It's actually automated refactoring. Okay. So sorcery integrates into your IDE. If you're using PyCharm or VS Code, then you can just install it from the marketplace and it will scan the file of codes that you're working on and it'll read the functions and understand them. And if it sees any refactorings, it'll suggest them to you just by highlighting a line of code. You can hover over that highlight and see a full description of the refactoring, an English description, the steps that are taken, and then the code diff. And then you can apply that directly to your code and get automated refactorings. So, for example, you were just talking about with, it'll, if it sees you opening and closing a file um, without using a with, it can suggest that and do it for you. Or turn you know, a for loop into a list comprehension. Or use built-in functions like any, all, min, max, if you're not using them. Or sum or count. Okay. Or it can do things like, you know, inverting if statements or simplifying complex nested if statement logic, if it can be, or like removing unnecessary tests from if statements, if they're, if they're always true, that sort of thing. <laughs> that makes sense. So when you say inverted, like it, it may make sense to travel this path because this is the most common answer. And it would, again, the idea of short circuiting, like you said, with any or all is kind of another one of those mm. where it might <laughs> short circuit and give you, you know, again, you know, it's not always about speed, but in this case, there is a lot <laughs> to uh, refactoring that can help with the idea of efficiency and, and cleanliness if it doesn't have to go through all those cases or and look at all the different pieces. So Yeah, it's kind of, we, we really focus on the kind of the readability, but sometimes performance is a nice side effect. Yeah. Yeah, cool. It sounds like, based on our earlier conversation, the idea that, okay, before I, I do this, I should look at adding tests and making sure that I, I've uh, broken it apart and found all the, the units that are, you know, parts of my code that need to be tested. And that should be the first step before I would try to run something like this. So having tests is always, so we talked about it before in terms of the confidence it gives you to manually refactor a code base. So we have a very, very strong requirement for all the refactorings that we opt, that we suggest from Sorcery, which is they don't change your code. Okay. And so this means you don't need tests in order to use Sorcery. But really, the only way that you can be confident about Sorcery is using it many times, seeing that the code changes are, in fact, true refactorings and don't change the meaning of your code Yeah, and build up that trust. And I can tell you right now that we put a lot of effort into it, but it's only when you actually try it out and see that it's true that you gain that level of trust with the tool. And there's a a free version of it so that if somebody wanted to explore with it, like you said, you could go into the VS code or uh, PyCharm marketplace kind of things and add it to sort of experiment with it on maybe smaller projects and see the suggestions it makes and the ways that it can help you refactor. Yep. Yeah. It's totally free. Um, so you can just download it and get working within a few minutes, really. Cool. I guess the other thing to mention that people are often concerned about is that, it kind of runs totally locally on your machine, so it doesn't send us any of your code. Okay. It um, talks to a kind of local binary, yeah. Okay, nice. And then one of the things that it definitely would help with as we kind of you know move from this idea of an individual using it and as we move into these larger situations where, again, where the term refactoring kind of comes up more and more, it isn't always just these personal projects, but these larger organizational size projects. And one of the things that I was wondering about was kind of leading to readability is, is before you run something like this, is it a good idea to, to have a set code reformatting? Is that something that, that is something you suggest 
you you do beforehand? Yeah, definitely. I mean, formatting a large code base ideally is something that would be a single commit operation. So if the code base has never been formatted before using a tool like Black or yet another Python formatter, yeah, do a single commit where the whole code base is formatted so that it's more easy to separate out that change when doing mm. when looking back at the changes in the past. Like what caused this to change? Especially with git blame and things like that. Okay. You can actually exclude specific commits. And that's obviously a very important one to to exclude because the whole code base will probably change. Right. But once you've got a code base that's really nicely formatted, that's great because it's so much easier to read. There's a little bit less cognitive load to <laughs> understanding yeah. how things are put together. It's always going to be in the same place. Yeah. And it's easier to understand when lines are going to spill over and all the rest of it. But it's important to set up some sort of CI to make sure it kind of stays that way and people can't commit things that aren't formatted. Yeah. You want know, to get into a kind of war going back and forth between different formatting. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, having uh, this impartial third-party tool, something like Black, is kind of nice in that way. And, and you can hopefully rise above <laughs> those kinds of things and, and worry about the next level. Yeah, but it's it's a hierarchy of things. So, yeah, I would say code formatting is just like an easy win. It, there's no reason not to do it. There's, the only cost is setting it up in the CI and possibly as a pre-commit locally. But, yeah, that time saved will be from that point onwards. And then tests. Tests. Yeah. Like to know that the code is doing the right thing. <laughs> Investing time in that is just so worth it. And uh, yeah, it gives you that confidence to then add new functionality. Or if there's a bug, then you can write a test for that bug. And then you know that that bug will never be re reintroduced to the code base. And then you can do manual refactoring and you can be confident that a tool like Sorcery is working correctly. And yeah. And then use tool like maybe a linting tool on top of that or a type checker like MyPy. Yeah. And so you build up these layers of like increasing ease of working with the code, increasing confidence that it's doing the right thing, and increasing knowledge that in the future it's going to be easy to extend the code base. And Sorcery is a big part of that. And the, the great thing about it is we've designed it so it can be used even if you don't have all of these other tools. So if you haven't formatted your code base, then Sorcery will respect the surrounding code formatting. Okay. And if you don't have tests, we change the code so it won't change the meaning of the code. So you can use it even if you don't have all of these other things. I still recommend going and getting all those other things too. <laughs> They're all great. Yeah, absolutely. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It's a course that I mentioned briefly in this episode. The course covers one of the fundamental tools used in Python programming, and it's titled Python Booleans, Leveraging the Value of Truth. The course is based on a real Python article by Moshe Zadka, and in the course, Cesar Aguilar takes you through how to use Python Booleans to write efficient and readable Python code, manipulate Boolean values using Boolean operators, convert Booleans to other types, and convert other types to Python Booleans. You'll learn techniques to make your code more efficient and how to take advantage of how your Python code flows through these decisions. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn how to better control the decisions made within your code. And like most of the video courses on Real Python, the course is broken into easily consumable sections. You get code examples for the techniques shown, and all courses have transcripts, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find the link in the show notes or you can find it using the newly enhanced search tool on realpython.com. I wonder about that in, in, in an organization that if it's an individual and they're kind of learning the tools and, and getting familiar with these types of things, I, I definitely can see the advantages of like looking at, okay, well, why did it do this and, and so forth and using it a bit as a learning tool, which is always kind of 
one of the focuses I have. But as an organization gets into it, then it's almost like you need to have a bit of a hierarchy of like, okay, well, we need to address <laughs> a, a bunch of things. Okay, do we need to have some comments added and should we rename some things? You know, how should we go ahead and, and use a formatter and make sure that this is good to kind of get past all those kind of arguments? And then the whole quest of having the, the tests added and then hopefully by that point you're like okay now we're ready to to look at refactoring the code and and uh, uh, making it um, more extensible and um, looking at ways of like okay how can i make this be efficient like you said not having to have everything be <laughs> so huge that nobody can hold it in their head and have to kind of like try to flow through things i, I was just going to say there's some of those things require organizational choices yeah so you need to go and convince whoever is in charge that we should use a code formatter or we should be writing a lot more tests because there's an investment that needs to be made, a choice that needs to be made by whoever's in charge to invest that time. Right. Um, and maybe that's not their priority. On a, lo- on a local level... So if you're an engineer, you need to kind of frame it in language they understand, just to interject. Right. You need to br- break out the, the triangle again <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and say, um, okay, well, this is what potentially we're going to do by, you know, adding all these changes without having tests. And this is, you know, where the time could get sunk or, or whatever. And kind of like, it's kind of strange that you have to have those kinds of conversations, but I'm sure it happens every day in these types of organizations where, you you know, it's like, okay, you will, you would like you would really like these changes to happen, but in order to have that, there needs to be a bit of infrastructure. <laughs> there needs to be some scaffolding before <laughs> we make these changes. So, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. So, if you're working, obviously, when you're working alone, you've got different choices that you can make. So you can choose to do some of these things even without the whole organization doing it. So you could format your own code, you could write your own tests, you could add the documentation and you can refactor the code that you're working on before you add the new feature. And if you do all these things, your your output will be better. And when the next person comes along and works on your code, they'll be like, oh, okay, this guy right. writes good code. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You'll get a lot of respect and friends within your team to be great yeah totally <laughs> <laughs> do you have any examples of, of code bases where you've seen refactoring make a huge difference yeah so i've certainly seen where it, like on our own code base okay is a great example of where we're constantly refactoring it and it's kind of very clear what everything does everything's very separated when you make changes it's super quick so it's kind of obviously something we take great care to do yeah, and spend a fair amount of time doing. I guess where changes like that can turn a bit dangerous is if where you're trying to do too much at once, it turns into a rewrite. Like I was on a project, it's kind of this financial system, and it was rewriting the whole interface to the front office. It sort of took two years for three developers. Wow. And uh, yeah, you ended up with something that was kind of better structured, but did the same. <laughs> and like... Maybe that was a bit of wasted effort. It's hard to sell that sometimes, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, but this is so much easier for the future. <laughs> but at, at the time with no new features. <laughs> yeah. Small is beautiful when it comes to refactoring. Yeah. Do you have examples of, of communication sort of failing in between these steps? I mean, one thing that can go wrong, and it happens even just between Nick and myself, is... One of us decides to refactor a file and the other one's making a change to that file at the same time. <laughs> oh, okay. And then someone's going to have their codes merged before the other one. And then the other one's going to have this really tricky situation where there's a big conflict because mm. code has changed under their feet and somehow they need to put the code together so that it's still refactored, but it's got all the new functionality. And <laughs> that can be really tricky, actually. So, yeah, would a tool like Git have 
um, any, I mean, you can create branches and, and kind of work on things independently, but communicating that this code is quote unquote checked out, (laughs) you know, like right now out of the library and somebody shouldn't be trying to modify it while this other person's working on it. I don't know if there's like something that shows that I worked for a law office and they had this massive documentation system that was very much like that. It was very much like a library where this legal brief would be checked out and, you know, potentially put on somebody's laptop and they'd be working on it independently. But you knew that, that, that it was, you know, off site and doing this thing before it got checked back in, if that makes sense. And I don't know if there's really a, a code equivalent. Yeah. So we, in a previous company that we both worked at, there was a different tool called surround for hmm. managing the code base. And there were a few files that had to be locked out. Yeah. Well, actually, when it, whenever you did a code change, you locked out all of the codes that you needed. And also, there were some other parts of the code base that were just locked down, and you had to go and speak to the management to get them unlocked <laughs> to make changes to <laughs> To unlock it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And wow. so, in, in terms of the communication, it was great. It was obvious when something was not available. But actually, the cost side of it was enormous because there was so much additional communication of like, oh, when are you going to finish this piece of work? When yeah. can I get it? And then it's like, oh, actually, you need to speak to someone else because they've got it next. <laughs> and then, yeah. so, so it's kind of best, I think, just to keep your changes small and take the pain of, of merging. Yeah. But yeah, probably even between the two of us, we could have had better communication about, actually, I'm, I'm refactoring this file. Please just... Uh, don't change it for a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please don't add anything right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Did we hit most of the things with sorcery? Yeah. So there's a few other things. So so we directly support VS Code and PyCharm. There's also more beta versions for Sublime and Vim. Okay. Which are a little harder to set up, but we've got full documentation of that that you can access from our website. And then we also have a GitHub bot that will review pull requests and offer refactoring suggestions on the code that's changed in the pull requests. So that bit of code is is not running locally at that point, is that right? Yeah, so that's more for open source code bases. Okay. Or if you've got a private code base, that's a paid feature. But yeah, that's running in the cloud. But the in your IDE, it's local. Okay. And the other thing is, if you want to try Sorcery out super quickly, you can start our GitHub repo, and then our bot will find your most popular Python repo and send you a pull request. Okay, cool. So you just kind of do it right through GitHub then. That's nice. Yeah. Okay, well, I have a few weekly questions I like to ask everybody. And the first one was, what's something that you're excited about in the world of Python? Yeah, so I think I want to check out I think you mentioned it, PyLance. So I've heard great things about it, but I've not tried it out yet. Yeah. And maybe it'll be a thing to convince me to switch to VS Code. So currently I use PyCharm. I like it. It's it's pretty clever stuff, This using this whole language server sort of technology that really kind of is taking the completion to the next level, which is is neat. They're, they're very, very actively working on it, which is cool. Yeah, so we actually use the language server protocol for sorcery as well. That's how we integrate with VS Code. Okay, cool. What's something you're excited about, Brendan? Yeah, so I actually come from where I used to do Scala all the time, and that's probably the reason that we were such keen adopters of typing and MyPy in Python. Yeah. And one of the things that I really loved in Scala was pattern matching, and so you actually told us in our previous chat that pattern matching is now landed in three three ten. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's uh, awesome. I mean pattern matching is fantastic. It just makes makes the readability of conditional code execution just so much clearer and it allows you to do so many brilliant things. But yeah, I can't wait to actually start using it. So that's brilliant. Yeah. I'm pretty excited to play with it too. I like the idea that they added that tutorial pep. Um, I hope that's a, a thing going forward where you can, you know, not only get sort of the explanation and all the other peps, but then in in another sense, beyond the history, it's like, okay, like, show me some examples of using it and like 
what were your thoughts in this, you know, creator of this thing, how you see it being implemented, I think is really kind of nice. Cool. I didn't realize there was a, a tutorial. I'll have to check that out as well. Yeah. It's a separate pep for that. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> um, I don't have the n- number in, yeah, I don't have the number in front of me, but yeah, there's a pep that um, has a whole set of uh, explanations of how to, uh, how to apply it. It uses this uh, text adventure uh, style language for a bunch of it, which is pretty clever. Oh, amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> I'll so hopefully that'll help. Play that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I could see implementing something like that. Yeah. And the next is uh, what do you want to learn next? Yeah. I think it's so probably similar. It's probably time to start learning how the Walrus operator works and some of these new things. We've kind of been heads down working on the existing code and lost sight of some of the new Python features. So I think that and pattern matching are probably the next things I want to learn as well. Okay. Cool. So we have, as well as the sorcery binary that um, refactors your code, we also have a server that's written in Python. And uh, we currently use Starlet for that, which is really, really nice. Okay. Uh, but recently I've discovered Fast API, which is a wrapper around Starlet and yeah. <laughs> just lets me everything that I've ever wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I want to get get him on the show, the guy who created it, um, to talk a little bit about it. It it definitely looks like a that nice sort of intersection of of typing and <laughs> and APIs and um, kind of helping you with the creation of of that in a much more efficient manner. Yeah, and and Starlet's just super super performant as well. So the fact that it's just a, a thin wrapper around that. I mean, it's got everything. The reason we picked Starlet was for performance in the first place, but having a nice API on top of that, perfect. Well, I guess that's why it's called Fast API. <laughs> it runs fast. Yeah, totally. And it's really fast to develop. So, yeah. Yeah, kind of multiple fast <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> well, cool. Well, I really want to thank you, Nick and Brendan, for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having us. It's been great. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Thank you. And don't forget, you can get started on DigitalOcean's app platform for free at do.co slash realpython. That's spelled D-O dot C-O slash realpython. I really want to thank Nick Thapen and Brendan McGinnis for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the RealPython podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the RealPython podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.